Have you ever noticed that there's, there's some things in life which, if you don't do them with all your heart, you may as well not do them. There are some things that if you're going to do them, you've just got to be passionate about them. It's, it's no use doing them in a half-hearted way whatsoever. It, there are some things, if you're not going to do them flat out, you may as well not do them. I want you to picture this. You're at the big concert. This is, this is the tickets that you've been hanging for. And you and all your mates are there in the concert. And because you've got in early, you've got dance floor tickets. And you're not stuck up there way back in the stands, but you're right down the front, right in front of the stage. You're in the mosh pit. And I want you to picture how things happen in a mosh pit. Have you got it? You're in there, your favourite band is playing, and this is what the mosh pit looks like. Well, Marmaduke, what do you think of the band? Oh, I think they're jolly good tonight. Yes, yes, they are kind of an excellent musical ensemble, aren't they? Yes, 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 I would think so. Yes, yes, I think they're improving as they go on. Uh, would you like a cup of tea? Uh, why, yes, Marmaduke. Uh, a cup of, of, of good English tea would be, would be quite appropriate. Uh, what's wrong with this picture? This is a mosh pit. Can you imagine people standing there in the mosh pit with their arms folded, just making comments about the band? That, that is not a mosh pit. If you're in a mosh pit, man, you've got to do it with all your heart. You've got to do it passionately. Because if you're not doing it with all your heart, it's not worth doing. There's a young man, there's a, a young woman, and uh, why they, they met at Impact. And it's the day of their wedding. Isn't that exciting? Aww. And bride is paraded down the aisle, and there's her man, there's the minister. He's asking some questions, and he turns to the bloke, and he says, will you? Take this woman to be your wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, and better for worse, richer for poorer, sickness and health, until death do you part. And he says, eh, whatever. And the minister says, hang on, will you take this woman to be your wife? The bloke says, I uh, guess so. The minister says, hang on, are you committing yourself to take this woman to be your wife. He says, oh, well, you know, I've got nothing better to do. <laughs> Does that make sense? If you're not willing to passionately commit yourself in marriage, it is just not worth doing. There are some things in life that if you're not doing them flat out, they are simply not worth doing. Imagine you've got a little brother or sister you know, three-year-old, you know, that sort of age. And uh, they've come on camp. And here we are, and suddenly we find that one of the three-year-olds has gone missing. We don't know where they are. They're not in their room. They're not in the auditorium. Um, no one's seen them for an hour or so. And we think, oh, my goodness, there's a, there's a river out there. There's bush that way. We say, guys, there's a three-year-old gone missing. Let's go looking. And so some of you wander out and just sort of walk around the oval once and you say, can't find them. Nah, they're gone. Yeah, you can't spot them anyway. Isn't it time for morning tea? No, you wouldn't do that, would you? If a little kid is missing, you don't just have a casual look and, and decide it's too much bother. If a little kid is missing, we have every single person here and we're out looking. We're working in teams. We've got phone contact. We're calling the emergency services. We, the volunteers are scouring the bush and we don't give up until that little kid is found. Because there are some things in life which if you don't do them with all your heart, there are some things which you don't do them with passion. If there's some things, if you don't do them flat out, they are simply not worth doing. What about this living as a Christian bit? Is that something you've got to be passionate about? Is that something you've got to be wholehearted in doing it? Or is it okay that you just do it? I mean, Jesus says you've got to trust him. Jesus says you've got to obey him. Jesus says you've got to follow him. And I'm prepared to do that, but have I got to be excited about it? 
isn't it okay if I just do it? Because let me tell you how it goes. Somewhere where you're in junior high, you know, just starting high school, you find out about Jesus and you decide to give your life to him and, and suddenly it's very exciting. It's very passionate. It's, it's, it's a buzz. And you remember the first impact you came on. You remember what crossfire was like when you were a little kid. And man, no one ever had to encourage you to be a Christian. You were absolutely on fire. You used to, to, used to drag all your friends to crossfire. You got half your school showing up. Um, you'd make a stand. You would stand up for Jesus. And no one ever needed to give you any encouragement to do it. You were just on a buzz, and you were on a supercharged, high adrenaline, uh, octane field, uh, caffeine permeated, uh, top of the range, top draw. You were just on fire as a Christian. Everything was a buzz, and you loved it, and you were supremely passionate. And then you get a little bit older. You know, you get to senior high, and you're still a Christian. You still love Jesus, but, you know, it's just not as much fun as it used to be. It just, it just seems like more of an effort. And you love crossfire, you love camps, but uh, it's not quite the buzz that you had when you were younger. And you're still following Jesus. You're just not as enthusiastic about it as you once were. Everything just takes a bit more effort. You're still following Jesus, but not wholeheartedly. And can I tell you it gets worse? Because when you get older and older and you get to your fat and forties, man, you become comfortable with everything in life. You know how you want your life to happen and you don't want anyone changing it. Now, you know by the time you're in your forties, you know what your favourite radio station is and, and won't be tired anyone who shifts it to another one. By the time you're in your 40s, you know how you like church. You know what your favourite seat is in a church. You don't want nothing changed. Because it's always been that way. And somehow that enthusiasm, that passion, that radical cutting edge, it just gets lost in there. Now, I just want to check this question with you. If you've lost your passion as a Christian, if you're just doing it but not doing it wholeheartedly, is that okay? Is it all right just to do it without getting passionate about it? And if you're thinking to yourself, man, I, I've lost some of that passion... How do you get it back? Here at Impact this week, we're looking at God rebuilding you to be awesome on the inside. And we kicked off last night in showing that God wants you to have a powerful heart. And this morning, I want to look with you that God wants to build in you now a passionate heart. Let me turn to what I call the passion principle. This is the verse in the Bible that gives us a reason for our passion. It's in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Colossians 3, 23. And it says this. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. Did you get that? Colossians 3, 23. Whatever you do, you work at it with all your heart as you're working for uh, the Lord and not for men. Now, did you catch the phrases there? You do stuff with all your heart, not half-heartedly. If something's worth doing, you do it well. You do it with passion. You do it 100%. But here's the interesting one. It says you do it because you're working for the Lord. You see, you don't um, read the Bible because your D-team coach said it was a good idea. You don't come and praise God because we write it in the program and tell you that you should show up. If you're on the servant squad, you don't paint buildings and landscape gardens because Mark is a slave driver. You do it because you're working for the Lord. You're imagining the task I'm working on now, I'm not doing it to please other human beings. I'm doing it like I'm doing it for Jesus himself. When you're at home and the parental pressure is upon you to tidy your room, as a Christian, you don't tidy your room because you want to please your parents. You don't tidy your room so that you can actually throw out the old food that's been there for 10 weeks. You don't tidy your room so you can find the underwear that you never washed from six months ago. Your, your number one motivation is you're tidying your room like you were getting the room ready for Jesus. You tidy it because you're working for the Lord. 
When you go back to school next week and all those wonderful teachers think it's a fantastic idea that you do lots of homework, uh, when you're sitting down to do your homework, you don't do it well so you get good marks. You don't do it well so your teacher will be pleased. You do it well as if Jesus himself were your teacher and you're doing it to present to him. That's the passion principle. When you're playing sport, you're out there with your mates, whatever team it is, whatever code of footy you play, whatever summer sport it is, um, you want to play well. You want to play enthusiastically. And you don't just do it because it's good for the team. You don't just do it so the coach won't yell at you at half time. You actually play passionately like you're playing on Jesus' team and you do it 100%. That is the passion principle from Colossians 3. Do you remember the words of Jesus? We heard them a little bit earlier this morning. This is in Mark 12, 28. And this is, this is the deal. It says, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Uh, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? And here's how Jesus answered. He said, the most important one is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, here's the important sentence. Love the Lord your God with some of your heart and some of your soul and some of your mind and some of your strength. Sound good? Happy with that? Did anyone check me? Is that what it says? Okay. I'll try and get it right this one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with most of your heart and most of your soul and most of your mind and most of your strength. We're doing better? Yeah, you know that's not what, you know what he says, don't you? He says, love the Lord your God with, say it, all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. It's Jesus saying if you're not following him passionately, if you're not following him wholeheartedly, if you're not following him with every bit of your heart, he's saying it's almost not worth doing. How do you regain that passionate heart? How do you be a disciple who is 100% on fire for Jesus? This morning, I want to suggest to you from the Bible four steps. Four steps to build the passion in your life as a Christian. Four steps to regain the passion that maybe you've lost. Here we go. Step number one. Hang to be with God. Hang to be with God. Let me go to the Psalms. This is, this is King David. And this is from Psalm 130, verse 5. And I want you to try and catch up how he is hanging to meet with God. Psalm 130, verse 5. He says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. O oh, Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord, there is unfailing love. And with him, there is full redemption. This is the picture of a bloke who is absolutely hanging to be with God. Did you pick up some of the ways he says it? He says there, I am waiting for the Lord. That he's ready before him, ready for the moment that he can interact with his God. How's he doing that? He says, I'm putting my hope in his word. He's got God's word there, and that's how he's going to interact. But look at the third description. I love this one. He says, more than watchmen wait for the morning. I am longing for you, Lord, more than the watchman waits for the morning. Now, you've got to understand what life was like in those days. The cities of those days had huge walls that had been built around them. Huge walls to protect them from being invaded. And what would happen is at night time, all the people who had been working out in the fields and out in the farms, they would come into the safety of the city wall. And the gates would be locked shut so that by night they couldn't be surprised by an enemy invader. And they would have watchmen patrolling the top 
of those um, mighty uh, walls ready to spot if any attacks come. And they would patrol from the time the sun went down till the time the sun came up. Now, just imagine you're one of those watchmen. Deep down, you don't really want anyone to attack. But the trouble with being a watchman on the city walls at night, nothing happens. And hour after hour, you're patrolling the city walls. Hour after hour, you're looking to see if there's an invader. What is the one thing that you are hanging for more than anything else? You are just longing to see the sun pop over the horizon to say that morning has come. Because when morning comes, you knock off, you can stop your patrols, and you know the city has slept safe for one more night. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've, you've had to be sort of up all night. Not because you want to, but just because you have to be. Maybe you've gone camping. <laughs> Some of our year 10s and 11s might experience this one tonight. You know how it's like impossible to get to sleep in a tent. You know, which, whichever way you turn yourself, it is just darn uncomfortable. Have you ever been in a tent and you, it, you're trying to get to sleep and hour after hour is going and you think, this is, this is ridiculous. I, and you want to get to sleep, but you can't. And eventually you're thinking, what I really want to see now is morning. Because when that sun comes up, we can get up, we can, we can get our food going. Maybe you've been on a camp and they've placed you in an incredibly hot cabin. And maybe you're one of those lucky year 11 guys that scored the super deluxe cabins. Um, who, who are the guys, now you know who you are, year 11 guys, who's in these super deluxe special three cabins here? Put your hands up. Can we have a round of applause for these mighty people? If you think your cabin was squashed and hot, you should see what they had to contend with. And I don't know whether any of you last night were just lying there and you're tired, but it's so darn hot that you're sweating and you can't sleep and there's the annoying little insects and there's annoying little smells and you just can't get to sleep. Imagine if you're there awake, how much you're longing for the morning. The morning you can get up, the morning you can get out of there. And David is saying, more than a watchman longs for the morning, that's how much my soul is longing to meet with God. Hang to be with God. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, why should I bother hanging like that to be with God? I mean, I can meet him any time. Any time I want to, I can chat to God. I got a Bible. The Bible doesn't disappear. It's there any time I want it. What do you mean, hanging to meet with God? I can do it any time. Well, have you ever wondered how God feels when he's thinking about hanging out with you? Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. How does God feel when he's thinking about hanging out with you, I tell you, Zephaniah 3.17 says this, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Now, let me show you how God is feeling with the thought of hanging out with you. It says, firstly, he takes great delight in you. Now, can you imagine that? With whatever you've done, and whatever you haven't done, the God of this universe says he takes great delight in you. The second thing it says is he will quiet you with his love. He will overwhelm you with his love. Whatever difficulties are going on for you, whatever troubles there are, whatever it is that you're finding really hard to cope with, God says, I will overwhelm you. I will overwhelm that with my love. And then he says this amazing line, that God will rejoice over you with singing. Now, just think about that. We talk about rejoicing over God with singing, and that's what we've been doing this morning. But think about this. This verse says that God is rejoicing over you with singing. Have you ever pictured that before? 
that when God is thinking about hanging out with you, he is so excited by, he is singing about you. He is so delighted. When um, Sean, that'll do, handsome Sean sitting here in the second row, God is thinking, because there's Sean. Sean is going to go to reach for his Bible. He's going to open his Bible and spend some time with God. And God is thinking, I get to hang out with Sean. And it says he is singing over you. I don't know what he's singing. I'm going to get to meet with Sean. This is going to be so cool. I don't know what he's singing. But have you ever thought of God singing with delight because he's going to meet with you? Now, if God is hanging to meet with you that much, how could you, how could you possibly not hang to be with God? And if you want to regain a passionate heart, hang to be with God. Do it when you feel like it, but do it when you don't feel like it. And you will find that God grows in you a passionate heart. Step number two to build a passionate heart is expect God to answer. Expect God to answer. And once again, I'm going back to King David, Psalm number five, verse three. This is what David says. Psalm five, verse three. He says, in the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait in expectation. Now, have you got that? David says, I bring my prayers to you and then I wait in expectation. David is actually waiting, expecting that God is going to answer. And you know, sometimes when I pray, I just pray it and forget about it. I don't even hang around to see if God's got an answer. And then I wonder why I'm not seeing his answer. David is expecting to see an answer. Now, I want to check with you. When you pray to God, are you expecting to see God answer? Or deep down, are you expecting that he probably won't answer? Oh, you know, I better pray about it, but I don't really think God's going to answer. Because I want to say, if you're praying for something and you're not expecting to see God's answer, then you ain't going to get God's answer. Does that make sense? You're praying for something, but you're not even expecting an answer. I want to suggest you're probably not even going to see God's answer. Because God is looking for the prayer of faith, which trusts him to hear it and trusts him to answer it. Test yourself. When you are praying for a friend who is sick, are you expecting to see them get better? When you're praying for somebody who's not a Christian and you want them to become a Christian, are you expecting to see them become a Christian? When you're praying for something that is lost, are you expecting it will be found? Many years ago, here at Impact, when, uh, when Mitch was, was but a young camper, um, I remember at night, uh, one night, around the pool down here, Mitch's watch went missing. And man, he didn't want to lose his watch, so he said, you know, I've lost my watch, I don't know where it is. And so I, being the sort of organised person, I started, you know, doing all the human activity to try and find his watch. So I said, okay, you three, can you go over there and look in that area of bush? Can you four go up there and comb the hill? Can you couple get back in the pool and just see if it's sunk to the bottom? We'll look over here. Here I am, organising everything like crazy, and one of the campers says... Perhaps we should pray about it. And I thought, yeah. <laughs> Great spiritual leadership, Tim. Perhaps we should pray about it. But do you know what I was thinking? At the time I was saying, yes, we should pray about it, I'll tell you what I was thinking. But the way we'll really find it is by being organised and searching thoroughly. We stopped we prayed that Mitch's watch would be found. And then somebody said, there it is over there. You see, when you pray for something, are you expecting to see an answer? Now, you know that God might have a different answer in mind than what you want, yes? Yes? Sometimes we ask for something and God's saying, no, 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 that's not what I want to give you. You know that God will answer in his own way, in his own time, and you know that he will give his answer and not necessarily your answer. But when you pray, do you expect to see his answer? Or deep down, 
Are you expecting that he won't answer? Because if you're praying for something and you're not expecting God to answer, then you ain't going to get his answer. And I'll tell you why. Psalm 37 verse 4. Psalm 37 verse 4. David says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, watch this one. If you're praying that God will do something, but in your heart you're not expecting him to answer, then the Bible says that God will give you the desire of your heart. And if your heart is saying, God, I don't expect an answer, guess what? You ain't going to get one. So if you're praying for something, but your heart doesn't even believe you're going to get it, the Bible says God will give you the desires of your heart. See, God wants to grow in you an expectant spirit. An expectant spirit, expecting to see God work. Now, you know what the word expected means. We have things called expectant mothers. You understand what an expectant mother is? She's got something growing and developing deep within her womb. And you can't actually see what it is, but you can see a sort of a lump developing. You are fully expecting. Now, why is she called an expectant mother? Because she is fully expecting that something miraculous is about to happen. She is fully expecting that a baby human being is about to be born. That's what it means to be an expectant mother. You see, you're not expecting that the lump in your womb is a baby chimpanzee. Does that make sense? You're not expecting that. You're not expecting that the lump in your womb is just a watermelon. It might look like a watermelon, but you aren't expecting it. That is, you are, even though you can't see it, even though you can't see the detail of it, you are fully expecting that God is about to bring birth to a brand new human being. And that's what it means to be expected in prayer. You see something that is growing and developing. You're not quite sure what it is. You can't see the detail, but you are fully expecting that God is about to produce a miracle. That God is going to answer that prayer and do something great. That's how you develop an expectant spirit in prayer. You know that something's growing and developing because you're praying for it and you are expecting to see God's answer. And that is a real key to growing a passionate heart. And let me tell you why you can be confident that God will work miracles. This is from Joshua 23. Joshua 23, 14. It says, you know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises that the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. If God's made a promise, he keeps it. So when you pray, do you expect to see an answer? When you read your Bible, do you expect to hear God challenge you personally? When you show up at rage and praise, do you expect that God will be honoured in everything we do? When you go to church, come on, are you expecting miracles to happen? When you go to church, are you expecting that God will show up? Are you expecting that God has a message for you? When you go to church, are you expecting that you're going to be built up because you're part of God's community? Because I want to say, if you were really expecting God to do miracles at church, you wouldn't miss it every second week because it's the movie you want to see. If you really expected that God was going to do great things at church... You wouldn't sit in the worst seats down the back somewhere, way over at the side. You wouldn't do that. If you're expecting God to do big things, you wouldn't stand around talking with your friends while the opening songs are on. You'd be there. You wouldn't want to miss a heartbeat. If you're expecting that God was going to speak to you through the message, you wouldn't sit there writing little notes to your friends and trying to arrange a date for Saturday week. If you really expected that God was going to do miracles when you went to church, you'd be there early, front row, centre stage, Bible open, hen in your hand, taking notes, joining in at every opportunity and not missing one heartbeat. If we had an open prayer time and invited people to pray, you wouldn't sit back and just let the old people come up and pray their long prayers. Because if you're not expecting God to do great things, you're not going to get it. 
I mean, imagine, imagine showing up at church where everybody came expecting to see God do miracles. Everyone came expecting to hear God challenge them personally. Everybody came expecting to see the answers to the prayers that were coming. Everyone came expecting that God would use them to build up and encourage the other people around them. Imagine being part of a congregation where everyone showed up expecting to see God do big things. Can you see how that would build the passion? You want to rebuild a passionate heart? Step one, hang to be with God. Step two, expect God to answer. Step three, praise God with everything you've got. King David once again, Psalm 103 says this, Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. I don't know if you've ever noticed this when we sing songs at Rage and Praise or Church, but generally they're in two categories. You're either singing directly to God, you know, you, O Lord, are my king, that sort of stuff, or sometimes you're actually singing to the people around you and saying to them, God is great, God is good. All right, you're telling the people around you how good. Now, when David sings this song, when David prays this prayer, who's he talking to? He says, praise the Lord, O my soul, almost all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Who's he talking to? He's talking to himself. I don't know where your soul is, but you know, it's down there somewhere. He's saying, hey, praise the Lord, O my soul. He says, all my inmost being, come on, my heart, my liver, my kidneys, my toenails, every bit of you, come on, fellas, let's all praise God. He's saying, I'm not just going to praise him with my voice. I'm not just going to praise him with my ears. I'm going to get my whole body praising God. And, and why can you praise him with everything? He, he, he'll tell us. Psalm 103, verse 1. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Now, in just in case you have forgotten his benefits, they're listed for you. Who forgives all your sins heals all your diseases, redeems your life from the pit, crowns you with love and compassion, satisfies your desire with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. See, you can praise God in so many ways and not just when we get together. Praise him 24-7. You can praise him every time you pray by yourself. You can praise God every time you obey your parents. You can praise God every time you make a stand for him at your school. You can praise him walking. You can praise him talking. You can praise him working a plough. Matter of fact, you've got to praise him right now. Whatever you're doing in every situation, all of you, every part of your being can be devoted to praising God. Wherever you praise him, however you praise him, don't do it half-heartedly. Praise him with all your soul and with all your mind and all your strength. When you come to church, when you come to Rage and Praise, and we praise God together, praise him with everything you've got. Praise him with his inmost, your inmost being. Now, let me tell you what I notice from time to time. You, you will find this hard to believe, but let me tell you what I have occasionally observed. We're gathered together at Rage and Praise or church and we're standing to praise God with all our inmost being. And sometimes I casually turn around and there are some people standing there with, wait for it, their mouths are closed. They're not even joining in. How could you? How could you not even join in the easiest way of praising God? Well, you know, I'm not into singing. Yeah, but are you into praising God? Yeah, well, if they picked a few decent songs, I might join in. You know, this is not exactly my favourite song. Hey, it's not for you, it's for God. Yeah, well, you know, I don't want to get too enthusiastic. I mean... <laughs> What would my friends think? Hey, what would God think? 
Can you see how God wants you to build you to be awesome on the inside? He wants to grow a passionate heart with you. Step one, hang to be with God. Step two, expect God to answer. Step three, praise him with everything you've got. Step four, proclaim God's word boldly. I want to look at a verse in Acts chapter four. Let me give you the background. Let me tell you what's going on here. Peter and John have healed a crippled man. By the power of Jesus. And they have proclaimed the message of Jesus to anyone who would listen. Now the authorities are very upset by this. They don't want this new message coming in. It's not the official state religion. And so they haul Peter and John off into custody because they've been telling people about Jesus. While they're being held, the other Christians are getting together and praying. Praying that they'll be released. Now eventually... The authorities decide to release them and they release them with this warning. We're letting you go this time, but don't you ever speak publicly about Jesus again. Because if you do, it's curtains. I'll pick it up in Acts chapter 4 verse 29. This is what's happening at the prayer meeting just as they come back. Acts 4 29 says, Now Lord... Consider their threats, the authorities, consider their threats and enable your servants to do what? To be clever next time so they don't get caught? Enable your servants to just have a very quiet personal faith and never tell anyone? No, this is what they, their prayer. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. They've just been released from the authorities and they're saying, no, let's pray that they're even bolder in talking about Jesus. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. That must have been some prayer meeting. They were praying so fervently and speaking the word of God with such boldness, it says the place where their meeting was shaken. And there is a world that God wants you to shake because you will go and proclaim his word boldly. There is a high school that God is sending you to that he wants to shake because he wants you to proclaim his word boldly. That's what God wants you to be like, passionate for him. You don't want to be some mealy-mouthed, wishy-washy, lukewarm, watered-down, no-name, low-octane, unleaded, bargain basement, go-low, self-service, bottom-of-the-barrel, bare-minimum Christian. Come on, that's not what God wants at all. He wants you to be on fire, hot to trot, steroid-induced, caffeine-concentrated, top drawer, gold medal. He wants you 100% passionate to be on his side. He wants you to be an on-fire disciple. God wants to grow in you a passionate heart. Remember the four steps to a passionate heart. Hang to be with God. Expect God to answer. Praise him with everything you've got. And proclaim God's word boldly. Now you might be wondering to yourself, why does all this matter? Let me introduce you to one of the kings over Israel. In God's Old Testament people... They would have a little summary sentence of the king. They would talk about how old he was when he came to the throne and, you know, how long he ruled for and, uh, you know, what sort of king he was. I want to tell you about a guy called Amaziah. Now, you've probably never heard of him and you don't need to have. Let me tell you about Amaziah. This is a little summary sentence of what sort of a leader was he. 2 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 1. 2 Chronicles 25. It says, Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem for 29 years. His mother's name was Jehoiadun. She was from Jerusalem. Now, here's the summary sentence about how he was going following God. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. So far, so good. But then it adds three more words. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord but not wholeheartedly. Have you got that description? He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. Now, is it possible 
that that could describe you. That you do what is right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. Amaziah ended up walking away from God forever. God wants to build you to be awesome on the inside. Are you game to let God's spirit loose in your life so that he grows in you a passionate heart? Come on, the place to be passionate is out there in the world that God is sending to you. But here we get to practice. Here we get to be passionate when we're surrounded by God's people. As the band leads us in our final songs, let's put into action the steps that will build a passionate heart. Because if you ask the question, how should you love God? Jesus says, come on, come on stage. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. Come on, stand to your feet. Come on, let's do it.